Only the righteous shall enter the kingdom of God. I awoke to a deep, demonic voice screaming in my ear. I nearly fell out of bed from the shock of the booming voice, ringing in my head. Breathing heavily, I looked frantically around the dark room. I was alone, of course. I can't keep lying to myself. The voices are coming back. I didn't think it would be so soon. I thought I would have more time. Let me back up a bit. I'm a 15-year-old boy living in a small town in Texas. I live with my mom and stepdad. We are good, old-fashioned, non-denominational, fire-and-brimstone Christians, and I'm schizophrenic. Other than that, my life sucks. Well, to be more specific, I have a schizophreniform disorder. Not that it makes much difference. All that means is I just haven't had it long enough yet to be called schizophrenic. To become a full-fledged member of the Real Housewives of Schizophrenia, I would need to have shown the symptoms for at least six months. In the beginning, I would hear stuff now and then. It was all harmless, and quite honestly, it was no big deal. You know, whatever. Then it started getting worse and louder. The voices would whisper constantly and say scary things to me. Sometimes they would scream in my ear without warning. I saw hands coming out of the walls and ceilings. Ghostly faces would charge at me and disappear just before reaching me. I couldn't wash my hands because of the eye that would look at me from the drain. Last year, it all came crashing down and I lost it. I ended up in one of those special hospitals for over a month. I thought my life was over, but you know what? It got better. I don't like how the medicine makes me feel, but it calms my head and clears my thoughts. My doctor is really cool, and he seems to really understand me. Not just about medicine and stuff, but about just being a kid. I see him a lot, and I'm learning things like coping skills and how to reality check my thoughts before I lose control. It's been eight months now, and I'm back in school and everything was going well for me. That is, until two days ago when my parents told me that I didn't need to take my medicine anymore. Four months ago, my parents joined a small church new to town. My mom and stepdad have always been religious, but they got really into this church, and before I knew it, we were going to church every Sunday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Saturday. Soon it was all about church and God. Nothing else was allowed because we were not of the world anymore, and everything else was evil and from the devil. Now, you might think my condition would make me susceptible to the scary things about religion, but it never did. I think some people are just born as skeptics. Maybe it's because of my love for history and science and the fact that the internet has given me access to limitless information to find my own answers. Maybe I hate my disease so much that the thought of invisible people watching me and appearing in visions makes me afraid. Maybe. My brain just can't accept talking snakes, Noah's Ark, or walking on water. The church, religion, and faith, those are all my parents' beliefs. It's not for me. I just don't have a choice about it right now. Honestly, I really hate the way it has changed my parents, and I miss the way they used to be. It was three Sundays ago when it started getting weird. The sermon was typical, everything is evil, Gays are an abomination, the devil is getting stronger, and Jesus is coming back soon. The pastor, Brother Carl, enthusiastically told his congregation that the end was coming soon and joyfully promised that God was going to punish all the sinners for their wicked ways. Soon church members began to feel the spirit of the Holy Ghost. They were in the aisles with their hands raised up. They were wailing and asking Jesus for forgiveness. Others began to speak in tongues, which really freaked me out. The preacher then began laying hands on people. He would place his hands on a person's forehead, pray loudly, then shove the person backward into the arms of the deacons. The person would then fall to the ground and flop around for a bit. They say that happens when the power of the Holy Spirit goes into a person's body, and it's so overwhelming that the person collapses to the floor. They call that being slain in the spirit. With no warning, my stepdad led me to the pulpit so that the congregation could lay hands on me. It was terrifying, and I don't like to be touched. 
I was surrounded by wild-eyed crazy people. They placed one hand on my body and raised the other one to heaven. The music in the background was blaring and ceased to be anything but incoherent noise devoid of any melody. The preacher began to pray loudly. In the name of Jesus, we pray that you take mercy on your child. Lord, we know that through you anything is possible and through you the devil has no power over us. The other worshippers made affirmations at the end of every sentence with, Yes, Jesus, praise Jesus, or, Oh, yes, Jesus, my Lord. The preacher continued, By the power of the name of Jesus, I command this infliction to leave this child of God. Be gone, evil spirit of schizophrenia. He pronounced it schizophrenia. Get out, get out. You are banished back to hell from where you came. You have no power here, unclean spirit. You have no authority here, foul demon. Leave this innocent child's mind. Leave this child's body. Leave in the name of Jesus Christ, your master and lord. The blood of the Lamb of God rebukes you back to the fiery pits of hell. Glory to God. Glory to Jesus. Glory be to his angels. Glory be to his cherubs. The assault on my senses was overwhelming. The overstimulation from the wailing and crying of the people who had surrounded me bombarded every one of my senses to its breaking point. Then, it happened. I heard a deafening hum, like the high tones heard in a hearing test. It grew louder and louder, and then everyone seemed to be outlined with a vibrant, rainbow-colored aura that pulsated and intensified until everything I saw was washed out from a blinding, white light. Then suddenly, it stopped. My vision slammed back into focus with such force that my head snapped back, as if I'd been slapped on the forehead. For a brief second, I saw them. Every one of the worshippers appeared to have something on their backs, peering over their shoulders. It was blurry and small, about the size of a large house cat. It looked as if it had one long arm wrapped around the person's body at the waist, or midsection, and the other arm was wrapped around their throat, snaking up the side of the face in branches of spidery veins. It was only for a split second, but I thought I could make out a face and small stubby wings. Friday. Before leaving for school, I went to the medicine cabinet to take my regular morning medication, but the bottle was gone. My parents had already left for work, so I went to school a bit confused since this had never happened before. That evening, my parents sat me down and told me to praise God. He had revealed to them through prayer that I would be healed. I stared at them with disbelief. First, from what they had just told me, then at the barely visible outline of a shape, a head resting on their necks with wings protruding from its back. Jeffrey. Monday. Today, I found myself distracted at the prospect of what's to come. What's going to happen to me without any pills? How will I act and how will I be treated? What what I am seeing will, will... Will the people at church try to exercise some demon out of me? I'm supposed to take my pills every day. It's poison. How many days has it been? Do they know I can see them? Yes. Can they see me? Yes. We see you. Are they real? Yes. We're real. Stop. Take a deep breath. Slow it down. Just slow it down. Are you there? Tuesday. It's hard for me to tell if the background noises from the school hallways are normal. Is... Is that a soft whisper or a child's laugh? Am I just freaking myself out? The fuzzy outlines with wings have returned. See you. Not everyone has them. Only a few adults so far. The shapes are definitely humanoid with tentacles for arms that secure its body to the back of its host. Its features are slowly becoming more defined. I can clearly make out a face. Jeffrey, we know what you see, you little shit. Jeffrey, don't us.
Wednesday. I'm having a good day. I stay away from anyone with a thing on their backs. Now, there are a few kids that have them too. What is strange, all the infected ones constantly carry Bibles in their hands. My last class of the day was biology. Ms. Guerra, our teacher, started the class with an announcement. Evolution will no longer be taught. She exclaimed that it's not a valid science, therefore it is untrue and a lie meant to deceive America's youth. She supported her argument by saying that if the atheists and scientists could really prove its validity, it wouldn't be just a theory, it would be a scientific law. She looked around the room of children and smirked. She said, going forward, a more reliable curriculum will be mandated. She then took out a large Bible, cleared her throat, and began to read. In the beginning, never passing up the opportunity to be a smart ass, I raised my hand to ask a question. What about the theory of gravity, the theory of relativity, or the germ theory? Are those not true, too? There's the atomic theory and the cell theory. No sooner had I spoke those words, the head of the shadowy creature that was latched onto her body snapped to attention. It opened its eyes and looked at me directly. It bellowed an eerie hiss that only I could hear. It took all my strength not to react to it. Kids already thought I was crazy. It wouldn't help matters by freaking out a class over an invisible monster. Ms. Guerra called the house tonight. It's been three hours since my stepdad came home and... The back of my arms and thighs still hurt really bad from the lashes. Chattery. Help you. Thursday. I can see fully formed bodies piggybacking some of the adults. It's like a baby, but bloated and swollen. They appear to be asleep. We are awake. But every once in a while, I can tell one is aware, surveying its surroundings. I hear the whispers all the time. God damn you, you stinking little piece of shit worm. We're gonna get it. I am so confused. My mind seems clear and sharp. My, my thoughts seem real and rational. Psst, psst, psst. So why am I seeing parasitic hell babies attached to people's backs? Why am I the only one seeing these goddamn, these goddamn cherubs? Friday. It's getting worse. I don't dare mention it to my parents. I... I can't go through that... P p prayer... Circle... Uh, circles and hands of a... Crop... Uh, crop circles aren't real. Um, yeah. They are conspiracies made of people trying to play jokes. I s saw it on TV. They don't even need special tools. They can do it. It can... Uh, do in one one night. Blessed are the meek. Hear me, only the righteous. Yea, though I walk through the valley. Can you hear me? Spare not the rod. Spoil the child. Spare not the rod. Spare not the rod. It's getting louder, and they're screaming at me. The humming won't go away. There are too many of them talking at once. I can't understand them. Something keeps touching the back of my neck and flicking my ears. The eye is back. It is in the drain and it's looking at me. It's looking at me. Oh my god, it keeps looking at me. Stop. Please stop. Stop. Breathe. Take deep breaths. And slow it down. Please. Slow it down. Then it stops. There's only silence. 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 Then I begin to hear a very faint and distant voice calling my name. Jeffrey. Jeffrey. Don't let them know you can see them. Three months ago. Is everything alright, Jeffrey? Yes. How are you getting along with your mom and dad? Fine. How are you doing with your meds? Fine. Just fine? 
Nothing else? Silence. Dr. Lewis sat up from his chair and took the empty space next to Jeffrey. His posture slouched in a manner similar to Jeffrey. The young doctor naturally fit the role of a big brother, a role most of his clients desperately needed, a role that came naturally to him. With an honesty that cannot be taught or learned and in his own boyish demeanor, he said, Jeffrey, you can tell me anything you want, or nothing at all. Either way, it's okay. What's important to know is I will be here when you need me. You don't have to face this alone. Tears began to roll over Jeffrey's cheek. I don't like the way it makes me feel. I don't like the way people look at me. People treat me differently. Everything I do is wrong. My mom loves God more than me. They hit me every time I do something wrong. Why me? What's wrong with me? What I do to deserve this? Fortunately, Jeffrey was looking down as he wept and did not see the flash of anger that escaped Dr. Lewis's face at the mention of the boy's parents. He knew the type. Believers, obsessed with their salvation in the afterlife, and blinded to the life they are living right here and right now. They completely miss the love that a religion can inspire. Life is not just sacrifice, obedience, and discipline, especially when it comes to your children. People like that only end up taking away their kid's childhood. Jeffrey, would you like for me to tell you what I think about schizophrenia? Jeffrey slowly nodded. For some people, I don't think it's just a disease. I think it's an ability only a few people have. It's something special. I don't understand, Jeffrey said through the tears. Well, think about it this way. Today's researchers are finding new and incredible discoveries every day. Discoveries never thought possible. Things about our universe, where it came from, and even about reality itself. Now, what if I were to tell you that we are very close to proving there are countless other universes that exist side by side and alongside our universe, an infinite number of dimensions coexisting next to one another like pages in a book. So close, just turn the page and you're there, yet forever separated and unaware of each other. What if you, and others like you, are not just seeing and hearing hallucinations? What if it's real, in a manner of speaking? What if you have the ability to catch glimpses and flashes of the other side? to look at the other side of the page. Someday, we might be able to separate the two and control it so it isn't confusing and frightening to the person. I see it as an amazing gift, even though I know it's hard to see it that way now. We know so little about the brain and just because your brain works differently doesn't necessarily make you sick. Someday, I believe it will be possible for you to use this skill and use it to become the first explorers to these new frontiers. Just imagine what you might see. Jeffrey's face showed both interest and then concern. What if they don't want to be seen? Dr. Lewis's brow furrowed. Come again? Jeffrey wiped the remaining tears off of his face and spoke, not with trepidation or distress, but with an analytical mind far beyond his years. What I saw and heard wasn't friendly. If it is real... What if they don't want to be seen? What if they don't know they can be seen? What if they don't know we are out here yet? What if they find us and then find a way to cross over? The young doctor paused for a moment. He'd never been confronted with this obvious flaw in his optimistic outlook of living with schizophrenia. He only wished to inspire those he knew would spend their entire lives battling to distinguish between the real and what is delusional. He looked Jeffrey directly in his eyes and was overcome with admiration and affection for the boy. He was such an intelligent and amazing kid that deserved better than he was dealt in life. Well, if they turn out to be some nasty little critters that don't want to be seen, then don't let them know you can see them, he said cheerfully. Regardless, you'll never have to deal with them alone, and they will never be stronger than you. You got that? You are always in control. If things start to get to be too much, just stop and tell yourself to slow it down. Just slow it down and let your mind catch up to you, okay? Yeah, Jeffrey said with a genuine smile. All right, kiddo. I will see you next week. 
Jeffrey got up to leave. Dr. Lewis could already tell the boy was feeling better. He could also see the bruises on the boy's forearm. A day or more, they'd probably be unnoticeable. Jeffrey turned to wave and Dr. Lewis again saw that amazing kid and thought to himself, shit. He was about to make one of his famous spur-of-the-moment decisions. He had already received a warning from the director regarding confronting parents on their methods of disciplining their children, unless, of course, there was cause for suspecting child abuse. He was also specifically told to avoid the topic entirely, especially with hillbillies like Mr. and Mrs. Mason. Jeffrey's parents were the worst kind. Crying and whining, they were being persecuted, and their religious freedom to whip their child with a belt was being violated. Dr. Lewis stood up and mentally prepared himself to put on his, also nearly as famous, alter ego known for kicking ass and taking names. He called out to Jeffrey. Oh, Jeffrey, go on and have a seat in the waiting room first. I need to have a word with your mom and dad for a second. I think things are going to get a lot better for you at home real soon. To awareness. I was relieved when I saw that my strange conversation had only been seconds long instead of minutes like it felt, but that was enough to be noticed by most of the kids in the courtyard. I looked at them and thought, well you know what? At least I don't have little slug babies sticking out of my back like most of you do, so the joke's on you. Since hearing the voice an hour ago, something interesting had occurred. Well, Something else interesting besides receiving an interdimensional message from another race. I think the message did something to me. Did something to my thoughts. It reminds me of that one time my stepdad's pickup truck had a tire that was unbalanced. When we would drive, it would thump and rattle the whole truck. 
He had the tire balanced and no more bumpy and noisy rides. Maybe the message somehow balanced my mind. The voices are definitely still there and my thoughts are still flying around, but now I could tune it out, like background noise. Things that are not real now appear to me as unreal. It's like watching a movie and knowing you're watching a movie. I can tell myself to slow it down, and now I'm able to do it. I'm not suffering anymore. I need to get out of here. There's too many of the faculty and students infected. I have a feeling some of the teachers have already been keeping an eye on me because of my recent behavior. If I word it right, I am sure I can get my mom to give me permission to leave early. Then I need to find help. My mom gave permission for me to leave and walk the three quarters of a mile to the house. I told her exactly what she wanted to hear. I'm struggling with the spirit today and I really could use some alone time with God. And it's such a nice day. It will make me feel closer to him. Liar. The walk home flew by quickly. I was lost in thought, thinking about my message. A rustling of leaves from a hedge to the right. What happened 300 years ago that was relevant? Well, what is relevant? They were dominant and in control and then they weren't. What happened? Well, let's see. These things are real and can only be seen by a few people. People like me. The people they suck on show extreme fanaticism towards religion. This fanaticism has been responsible for a large number of the wars and death in human history. They cause the hate, bigotry, and death from the world's religions. It wasn't only corruption that ruled the ancient world. It was the cherubs, or the, the putty, this entire time. But what happened that changed that? A swoosh of air. Flapping. Leaves rustling from the tree up above. Creaking from a bending branch. I rounded the corner of my street and picked up the pace. I had about 500 feet before I reached my front door. Branches rustling closer to the ground. Leaves falling to the ground. I'm confident I'm in control, but I'm not stupid either. I quickly pulled out my house key from my pocket and fumbled to get the front door open. I tried not to make it so obvious I was freaking out. Swoosh. Flapping. A soft thump of something landing on the roof. The tumblers within the old lock refused to cooperate with the key. Scratch. Something moving and scraping against the roof shingles. Scratch. Bits of dirt and debris fall from the edge of the roof's overhang. The key finally turned, unlocking the door, however. The old door was wedged within the frame, as old doors often do. I slammed my shoulder into the door, trying not to show how panicked I was. Finally, the door released from the frame and I nearly fell through it. I regained my balance and shut the door locking it so fast it was like magic. Witch! Wait a minute. What did you say? Witch? Burn the witch! Like from the witch trials? Like the Salem witch trials? Like during the Spanish Inquisition? Like Catholics and Protestants did to each other? The same people who started so many wars? Like the Crusades? They had so much power back then. They slaughtered millions of people in the name of God, but something happened that took the power away. Something happened in the past that gave humanity a window of opportunity that allowed science to take hold and grow. The putty never recovered from that. They're still trying as hard as they can to make it like it was, but religion has never regained the same level of power or influence it once had. So what happened? I spent the next hour looking through some old Britannia encyclopedias we had in the storage shed. I was reading about the end of the Age of Enlightenment and the French Revolution of 1789 when I decided to move from the living room into my bedroom. Entering my room, focused on finishing up the last paragraph of the page, I absently closed the door behind me and a light breeze began to flutter the pages of my book. I froze at the sight of an open window in my bedroom. We never left windows open when anyone wasn't home. Never. I quickly recovered and regained my composure. I scanned the room as naturally as possible and saw it immediately. Sitting on my bed, was a small and chubby baby with leathery skin and wings. It was sitting on its bottom, a familiar pose you would see in most baby pictures and portraits. Its arms and legs were abnormally long and slowly writhed from side to side. 
They weren't flexible like tentacles, but multi-jointed extremities with knuckles running the entire length of the appendage, ending in short, stubby digits. Its face was chubby, but not in a cute way. More like clumps of cottage cheese packed under its sickly gray skin. The nose was turned up and more like a piglet than a person. The eyes were bluish-white marbles, veined with red vesicles. They sat within sunken eye sockets enclosed by reddish-wet eyelids. The most disturbing feature was its blank facial expression and open mouth, shaped like an O. My intuition was screaming at me to run as fast as I could. It knows you can see it. But that would give me away. Without making it look too obvious, I needed to get out of my room as soon as possible. It was already suspicious. I walked to my closet and changed into a more comfortable shirt and then walked to my desk and pretended to read. It watched me intently without breaking its gaze. I could hear its heavy breathing from lungs that sounded like it was drowning in phlegm. My desk was positioned facing away from the bed, making it difficult to keep an eye on the monster. I pretended to read for as long as I could stand it. I think it's been long enough. I stretched and cocked my head towards the bed. The spot on the bed it had occupied was empty. At that moment, I felt a tug at my pant leg. The long, slender arm wrapped around my leg. I wouldn't look down if I were you. Without lowering my head, I let my eye slowly drift down and saw it preparing to crawl up my leg. I told you. As the appendage slithered up my leg, it slipped under my pant leg and started pulling down the socks I wore, exposing my bare skin. The moment it made contact with my skin, I felt a sensation like when you try to squish two opposite ends of a magnet together. Its entire body stiffened. A vivid image exploded in my mind that filled me with horror. Its head snapped upward and made eye contact with me. We stared at each other. Its face contorted into a look of horror and rage, and then it let out a blood-curdling scream that hurt my ears, a scream like a pig being slaughtered. There was no doubt anymore. I knew I could see it. You're fucked. It rapidly began to disentangle itself from me, but not before I lifted up my leg and began shaking it off violently, like my shoe was on fire. Off balance, I fell over my wooden chair and hit the floor hard. We sat up at the same time and locked eyes once again. It looked at me, then at the open window, then back at me. In a burst of speed, it scurried like an obscene worm along the floor towards the open window. I remembered my warning. Whatever you do, do not let them know you can see them. That nightmarish vision flashed in my mind again. Don't let it get away! It was lifting itself up from the window frame. Then I lunged at it and grabbed a leg dragging behind it. I yanked and pulled it off the windowsill like a cat who had dug its nails into the furniture. It fell to the floor and quickly turned and flicked its long arm at me like a whip snap. White, stinging pain exploded across my chest, and I immediately felt a warm wetness spread down my belly from a talon protruding from its little hand. Why didn't you tell me it had one of those? It postured at me, holding both its lanky arms upwards like two scorpion tails, one of its tips still covered in my blood. It started flicking its whip-like appendages in rapid succession, as it maneuvered its way back to its only escape. I wanted to run away, but the vision had shown me the consequences of that choice. If you let that little asshole get away, it's gonna tell the others about us. I quickly grabbed the seat portion of the smashed chair and held it up like a shield, and rammed the beast as hard as I could into the wall. Using all my body weight, I pinned it against the wall. From the edges of the chair seat, a flurry of wiggling tentacles, fluttering wings, and gurgling screams emerged. I pressed my shoulder into the wooden seat even harder. Through the chaotic whirlwind of twisting, slithering, screaming, and kicking, I reached around and got a good grip on one of its wings. I pulled as hard as I could until it tore from the creature's body like a piece of Velcro. Yeah, who's your daddy now, bitch? Blackish-brown body fluid sprayed out from the stump. The liquid looked and felt like motor oil and caused me to slip. We both slammed into the ground. It turned on its belly and weakly began to crawl once more towards the window. With its wings still in my hand, I quickly got to my knees and I beat it into unconsciousness with its own severed body part. I raced to the shed out back and found an old metal dog kennel that was still there. I dragged the heavy cage into my room, hoping the little demon had not regained consciousness. 
It was still lying on the floor, on its side, in a pool of its own blood that had now begun to congeal. I grabbed it and quickly flung it into the cage and locked the door with a padlock. I collapsed to the ground. I don't know how long I sat there studying it. I was also trying to ignore that one voice, the one that emerged after the message. It pushed all the other voices away, but it was so annoying. It was like having a vulgar little brother constantly talking in your ear. I jokingly thought to myself, if this is the price I have to pay for not being crazy, I think I'd rather be crazy. Speak for yourself, but face. This isn't exactly my definition of an ideal situation either. The ringing phone snapped me back to reality and I answered it, turning my back to the monstrosity. It was my mom checking in on me and asking if I needed anything, to which I replied, No. She informed me that she and my stepdad would be home soon after their prayer meeting. She went on a bit about some church-related activities. Oh my god, shut up. All right, Jeffrey, we will be home later this evening. Okay, Mom. Jeffrey? Yes, Mom. God is watching over you. Everything happens according to His will. You just need to accept His divine purpose. I know, Mom. Do you know? I see the doubt in your eyes. I see the questions you show towards His word. Punishment is what you have reaped and what you have sown. I'm praying for you. I'm praying real hard for you. I... I... I'm praying for you too, Mom. As I hung up the phone, I heard giggling from behind me. It was laying on its tummy with its chin resting gently on its arms that were folded tenderly over one another. It was a grotesque mimicry of the poses cherubs are typically known for in Renaissance paintings. The memory of the vision exploded in my head once again. It was me. I was suspended upside down in a small, dark room. There was mold on the walls and water dripping from pipeworks that lined the ceiling and walls. Every inch of my body was covered with embryonic blisters containing a fetus of a cherub. The papules pulsated and stretched my skin so far that it was torn. Large gashes from where skin and muscle had separated from itself were held together by the gelatinous, ropey cords that cocooned my body. Underneath the clusters and clusters of developing embryonic sacs, there was no hint that a little boy was still under there, except for one. A tear-filled eye, filled with terror, looking out from a spot left bare. One eye peeking out of a hole, a hole that reminded me so much of the drain hole. It continued to laugh, and then it spoke. It spoke with an evil, disturbing, high-pitched voice from within its cage. You've had it so wrong. God does not want your prayers. He wants your fear. We have abundant reason to rejoice that, in this land, the light of truth and reason has triumphed over the power of bigotry and superstition, and that every person may here worship God according to the dictates of his own heart. In this enlightened age, and in this land of equal liberty, it is our boast that a man's religious tenets will not forfeit the protection of the laws, nor deprive him of the right of attaining and holding the highest offices that are known in the United States. George Washington, Letter to the Members of the New Church in Baltimore, January 1793 